we won't take the whole 10 minutes on this last season of the CI for Walrus Outlook. And um, in case you're not familiar, I will just say a little bit about what the Outlook is. And um, it is a collaborative project that provides weekly forecasts of weather and sea ice conditions um, that combines both scientific and indigenous knowledge information um, into a single product. And the purpose of it is to provide subsistence hunters primarily and local communities with um, local information on sea ice and weather um, regarding subsistence hunting in the Bering Strait region. And um, the project is managed by Arcus, but um, it, it's a co definitely a collaborative project with support from the National Science Foundation. And our partners are the Eskimo Walrus Commission, which is primarily Vera Metcalf, and at the National Weather Service, we um, have Mary Beth Trek and Rick Toman, among others. At um, UAF IARC, we have Olivia Lee and Hayo Iken. And then um, I will go into more specifics about our community member contributors in a couple of slides. Um, just a little bit of background. This is our ninth season of the Outlook. It started in 2010. Um, it's just during the spring sea ice season currently. And um, our goal is to make it really accessible for people with low bandwidth, rural Alaskan community internet connections. So these are people that might not be able to go to the NOAA website and even load it because the images are big. So we have our file sizes very small and we do most of our um, communication now on Facebook because it's so commonly used in communities where um, the website is, is less visited. And we um, typically have satellite images each week. Uh, most of these are provided by the National Weather Service, but we'll take whatever we can get to include in the outlooks, um, especially if they're cloud-free from any sources, just to get the, the best information out to communities. And then for the weather forecast information each week, we focus a lot on wind. And this is really important because hunters are often traveling in these small open aluminum skiffs. And so if the swell comes up and if there's ice in there too, it can be really dangerous. So our, our focus is really primarily on safety. And then we also provide information on the temperature trends. Um, and this season, we um, had reports from seven communities in the Bering Strait. And for the first time, we had reports from Diomede and Brevig Mission. And this was from intentional, like, um, you know, just requesting and kind of begging and pleading, hey, is there anyone on Diomede that can report to us every week? And we were able to get some great photos and a few reports. Um, but a lot of our observers from our core communities that are there every year from Wales and Shishmaref, Nome, Savonka, and Campbell. These people are coming back every year and reporting. And we had 60 reports from local observers in our 13 week season, which was by far the most we've ever received. And um, it has improved recently because NSF has generously contributed to stipends for local observers. And they're not large, but you know, it places actual monetary value on, on their contributions to this product. So that's been extremely successful and we're hoping to um, keep doing that and possibly increase it. And so one thing that is really special about the Outlook is that it shares the um, scientific information and CI products with equal emphasis with the indigenous knowledge products with their photos and observations. And um, it's also um, what we've hoped would happen and kind of has happened in the last two seasons is especially Facebook and the comments on each observation have become a place where people can share local knowledge among communities. So um, people in Gamble can look at the comments and observations from someone in Nome and, and kind of get a more regional, well, regional local knowledge sharing hub via social media. And as I said before, just in this last season, we had 60 local observations. And so 
from the perspective of a scientist or someone who's looking at models of sea ice or weather in the Bering Strait, there is a wealth of information on the Sea Ice for Walrus Outlook website in the form of these local observations. And they're all there. From the very first observation in the first year, they're all archived. And you don't need a login or anything. They're just openly accessible. And I wanted to give just a couple of examples of what the local observations are like. And um, I'm not going to read these to you, but I just wanted to um, highlight that most of them include photos, like the one attached. Many of them are quantitative. So they're giving the distance to open water leads or um, they're giving the swell height and temperature and wind speed and also just local conditions about safety, like where is the ice rotten? Where is it not safe to like tow your boat with a snow machine out to the ice edge because it's starting to break up? And in addition to that, we're getting a lot of information on how animal migration and movement patterns and feeding patterns are changing or how they vary from place to place. Um, some of them are very long and very detailed, but um, one thing I wanted to highlight about this observation from Robert Sokina in Wales was that it's not just his own personal observation, but if you look at the last sentence, he's really kind of bringing in a community perspective and what locals in general are reporting about ice conditions, weather conditions. So just so much really valuable information and observations each week. So next year will be our 10th season. And um, so far, we have never had an in-person meeting for the Sea Ice for Walrus Outlook that brings together local observers and all the partners. So we are hoping to have a meeting this coming winter in Nome. And we're currently seeking funding for that. Um, because following a, a true co-production of knowledge model, we would love for the hunters and community members to really steer where the outlook is going in the future. Because the Bering Sea we have now is not the same Bering Sea we had 10 years ago. Um, we probably need to change to match that. We probably need to be more flexible with our timing. And, and we would like that to be very community driven. And then um, because 2018 was such an unusual CI season, we are going to collaborate um, on a paper for Witness the Arctic that will kind of go in depth and look at the community level impacts. Um, on uh, of the 2018 season locally and we're gonna matt um Drucken miller who's on here will partner with that and also igor krupnik at smithsonian will bring in some of his long-term perspectives on walrus hunting and then local observers will contribute to this paper as well so that should be out in the I think that issue of witness the arctic will be out in november or december so please watch for that um i also just wanted to throw in a slide here about which performance elements that um, the CIS for Walrus Outlook contributes to. And we align pretty perfectly with this one. Our um, collaborative network of scientists and stakeholders has grown this year to include two more communities. And we are very kind of real time and local scale, which um, is a little bit different than some of the many of the other CIS products out there. And then I just wanted to share a little bit of information on where to find us on Facebook and on our website. Great. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Um, I had a quick question and then two just perspective questions. One is, the quick one is, do you do a SIWO for fall? We don't. And that's one of the things we'd like to talk about in this meeting is, right now like there i mean maybe we should even be much earlier than we are to cover the spring whaling time or maybe we should be in fall because that's when a lot of hunting is happening as well as the ice is coming back through the strait so yeah these are all big questions okay all right well um, thank you for that and then um it seems like we're always saying how the previous year was so anomalous and so unusual and and um I'm wondering, you, you did key on 2018 as being yet another one of those years. Will you just focus on 18 or will you kind of just, I mean, maybe it's the variability that is so high that it makes the silo so important. So I guess I'm wondering for your article, are, will you do a survey or just focus on the last year? 
Right now we're reaching out. Olivia and I are both teaming up to talk to all of the local observers and interview them. And then um, Igor Krupnik has been kind of working with communities from uh, the perspective of subsistence walrus hunting um, through the Smithsonian for a long time. And so we're going to try to bring in all of these perspectives to look at 2018 specifically, but in the context of like a larger period of change, you know, kind of since I guess 2007 was maybe when the big shift really happened. But I don't know, it seems like the only constant in the, the Bering Sea is variability, but this year was really, really low ice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, let's, um, does anybody have any other questions for Lisa? Okay, if not, and, and we can always aggregate them at, as we go on with the talks. But let's move on to Donna Hauser now um, from University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hey, thanks. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. All right. Well, um, thanks for the invitation. I'm pretty new to IARPIC, so um, I thought I would do today is just provide an overview of the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. So I will um, just say from the beginning that I'll probably slip into calling this AOK. -okay. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, that's that acronym we use to refer to the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. So I joined this team, the science team, um, just nearly a year ago. And so I'm now the newly appointed science lead for AOK, -OK, but I've actually taken over for Olivia Lee, who of course is part of your community, and, um, and she's the one who invited me to speak about the program today. So um, AOK -OK is an effort that's led by the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And it's grown to some degree out of a previous project called Seizonet, that you may be familiar with, that was led by Hayo Eichen. Um, but at its heart, <clears throat> AOK -OK is meant to be a community-based effort. And so I include here also our current community um, observers. So from Ukiagvik and Wainwright, Point Hope, and uh, Wales. So, um, so of course, they're representing the AOK -OK project as well. So let's see. I've got to advance here. There we go. So the goal of the um, Alaska Arctic and Observatory and Knowledge Hub is to provide Northern Alaska coast communities with the um, scientific support and tools and resources to share their expertise and observations of um, environmental change. And so as our name suggests, we kind of have two major components. So um, first we are supporting participatory science in the collection of observations. And so, um, similar to the sea ice for walrus outlook, um, the observations are primarily focused on ice, but we also encourage observations co coincidentally of wildlife and coastal oceanography. We get observations regularly contributed in a variety of formats. Um, often it's a text description with geotagged pictures and then also sometimes some more quantitative types of measurements. Um, and then the second component of the project is the Knowledge Hub. And so that's meant to network among these communities, um, providing some scientific context to their coastal observations and put it sort of in the idea that this is a changing seasonal cycle and what does that mean to communities um, and through scientific observations as well. And so here I'm including a picture of Billy Adams from Utyagvik this spring um, because uh, I think of AOK -okay and its predecessor programs like Cizonet um, being built on this premise and the acknowledgement of the unique expertise of indigenous knowledge about um, sea ice and wildlife and coastal conditions. And so um, indigenous knowledge is this holistic way of thinking that um, is based on a deep understanding of these localized environmental processes. And so we envision AOK -okay as a space for sharing and networking and archiving that knowledge, but also supporting linkages to more conventional science as well. And so um, I'll just next go through a few slides that give you examples of the types of observations that are provided by our community observers. And sea ice observations are really one of the cornerstones of the observing program. It, um, observations typically include a verbal snow and ice description. Um, they talk about nearshore sea ice hazards, provide photographs. Um, we get information on phenology, so the timing and formation of 
things like slush ice, freeze up and break up conditions. And so here's um, an example from Billy Adams again in Utyagvik just a little over a week ago. And so in this example photo and observation, um, Billy sent a picture of these broken up ice fragments, um, which had occurred after a, a storm and um, broken up sea ice from the Beaufort Sea onto the beach um, near Barrow of Yagvik. And so Hayo, who also, Hayo Eichen, who also got this observation, responded to Billy saying that he'd never seen this kind of brash ice on the North Slope in the summer before. And so, you know, this is where Billy responded by saying, yeah, some of these ice chunks did break up into balls. Um, he gave us a little bit more about the process and the Inupiaq name for that, um, as well as some of the traditional uses. So I'm not gonna read that whole observation for you, but um, so that gives you a, sort of the idea of the back and forth and what kind of observations we get in terms of sea ice. Um, we also get the associated wildlife observations or reports of hunting activity often. Um, by training, I'm actually a marine ecologist, and so I've been sort of trying to work to infuse uh, biology in a more systematic way into the observing program as well. Here's a, an example showing Dolly Varden from, um, and the in associated environmental conditions from um, Stephen Pekatuck in Wainwright. And so, you know, he says, you know, the ocean current was flowing strong to the Northeast. Um, somebody tried boating out of the inlet, but there was rough water, um, higher tides, higher waves than normal. Um, and so he was gill netting out back in the lagoon. Uh, along the bottom row here, I'm showing some photos contributed uh, this past year again from Billy and Ukiagvik. And so some of the species you'll see, um, they represent wildlife species that you would expect to see. So bowhead whales, um, where we can start tracking the phenology of bowhead whales relative to the phenology of sea ice, for example. Um, we also would expect to see polar bears, which is, this is a yearling uh, polar bear feeding on a ring seal outside of uh, Barrow in the spring. But we also are starting to see some rather novel wildlife species. So those could be species that might be rare, such as this ivory gull, um, or unexpected, such as the stellar sea lion, which was just a week ago. Um, Billy sent this picture from his hunter colleague um, of a stellar sea lion on the beach at Monument just outside of Barrow. And so uh, this was quite unexpected. Stellar sea lions aren't supposed to range further north than Bering Strait. So we can start tracking sort of some of these uh, unusual and novel um, wildlife species through the pro program as well. Um, several of our observers also have oceanographic instruments, and so they are collecting temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll data at depth. So um, the idea here is that observers can collect this oceanographic data to help explain ocean heat drivers and biological productivity. And this is something that um, I think is of a lot of interest to several of the community members. Um, and so we've started posting this data online. This is an example um, CTD cast from uh, industry partners at Prudhoe Bay this June. And you can see, so, so this was during the melt period um, and we had this fresh, relatively warm and less dense melt water um, through forming this lens near the ocean surface. Um, so the idea here is that we can start using these various types of AOK -OK observations to put the pieces together and answer questions about the changing seasonal cycle. Um, so for example, one question might be, how do changing sea ice regimes affect the access and availability of traditional resources? Um, so one of my, my colleagues, Sue Moore, when she saw this um, graphic of the, she called it the, the palette of subsistence foods across the seasons. Um, and so really when we think about how does um, later freeze up or earlier break up maybe affect um, the access and availability of those resources. And um, I've included here a picture and observation from Jack Lane in Point Hope where he comments on how the ice wasn't too safe this past spring. It was only eight inches to two feet thick. They were doing some hunting, but the ice was thin. There were no pressure ridges. Um, they were able to get one whale, but it was bad ice and they had lots of snow. Okay, so um, hopefully that gave you an idea of the types of data and what we think of as some of the relevance to the communities. Um, now I'll just include a couple of slides on the Knowledge Hub piece of AOK. Okay. And so again, the idea is that we're trying to create linkages and those can be links between or within communities, but also with conventional scientists. 
And so several of the goals include things like sharing observations while also building on um, a pretty big existing database um, from that previous project, Sizonet. So all of the local observations are, are housed in a secure database um, with the exchange of local observations and knowledge of the ARDIT, the ALOCA program. So currently we have over 6,000 local observations that build on that previous size of net project and then the new AOK um, observations as well. Uh, we are also trying to link to existing relevant data and support efforts where scientists and local sea ice experts converge. And so here's an example from the Utyagvik Ice Trail Mapping Project um, that Matt Druckenmiller has been involved in for several years. And so now we're working with Matt um, this spring and hopefully next year as well to support this um, map trail, uh, this trail mapping effort as an ongoing effort. Um, and, and the idea from our perspective is to bring this um, ice thickness measurements um, into the context of um, the observations um, collected by our AOK observers and in the communities. So we can sort of link those two different types of data sets in one place. <clears throat> Um, and then lastly, we don't actually have any active programs, but are trying to expand youth opportunities and education and outreach components of um, AOK as well. So we have um, Elena Sparrow on staff here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who's an education, out, um, education specialist. And so we're, we're hoping that we can start advancing some of um, those goals as well. Okay, and so then I want to point out that we've just recently launched this interactive mapping tool um, and data tour. And so it's really meant to provide a mashup of the different types of data and a tour of the different types of AOK data in the context of other relevant uh, data. So that could be satellite, um, remotely sensed um, sea ice data, for example, um, in, in the context of some of our observations. And so I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, this is the, you can click that link. And um, we, of course, you know, having just launched this about a week ago now, actually, um, we already have things that we want to modify, but are really hoping to get some feedback on, um, you know, understanding the ability to access these data as well as to just sort of see, mash it up together and see what it, it can tell us. Um, so I'll just end by acknowledging our funding, which is from the Alaska Department of Justice, um, and then several you know, ways to find out more. So um, we've been working a lot on our website over the last several months. I encourage you to check it out and learn more about the project. Um, we also, similar to the Sea Ice for Wallace Outlook, are finding that Facebook is a really good way to engage with our communities. And so we have a um, growing following on Facebook and um, and post some recent observations there. Um, so you can check us out there. And then of course, I'm happy to um, field some questions now, but uh, you can contact me later as well. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Um, are there any questions? Hi, this is Meredith. I have a question. I'm wondering um, what the, if there are any connections between AOK -okay and the LEO network, if there's been any integration of those. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and in fact, I don't know if Olivia is still on the line, but um, so Olivia Lee, who I mentioned was the previous science lead for the project, um, had actually very actively had a, um, had a project where they were linking those observations. So right now we, you know, I think we're both aware of our different projects, um, but we don't have any direct links at the very, very moment. Um, if Olivia is on the line still, she can jump in there too. Looks like she's maybe not. She's coming back on the line towards the end of the call. Yeah. And, and, and so I guess that just the last thing I'll say about that is that, um, so Leo, if, as I understand it, is really focused on these unusual or unexpected observations. And so, uh, I, you know, I mentioned the stellar sea lion observation um, from Ikiagvik last week. That would be one good example. And so um, in that case, you know, I made sure that we contacted other relevant um, folks from state and local and federal agencies um, to be aware of that, that kind of thing as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Donna? Okay, 
Well, Donna, I'm kind of, I was excited to see that latest product that you had um, shown there with the SAR image and the near shore ice environment with potential CTD information. So I'll definitely be checking that out. Yeah, and like I said, it's the first iteration, but we are excited to, to launch that and um, have a lot, a lot of changes already planned for it, but, um, but we're really excited to get feedback, so great. Will do. All right, so on to our final presentation before we get into a group discussion. It's, it's on Surge Sea Ice Action Team and Matthew Drunkenmiller from National Snow and Ice Data Center. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay, is that is that sharing okay? Okay. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so th th this will be a, a brief update on the current activities of the Study of Environmental Arctic Change Search Sea Ice Action Team. So the CIS Action Team is co-led by Jennifer Francis at, at Rutgers University and Henry Huntington out of Eagle River, Alaska. And I, I serve as the team's coordinator and research lead. So I'll go fairly quickly through these items and stay quite general, but please feel free to follow up with me offline if, if you're interested in, in learning more. So very quickly, the team has, has four overarching objectives. And I'll, I'll just read these very quickly for, for broader context. First, to, to build upon ongoing efforts to define and summarize the breadth of consequences of rapid sea ice loss in the seasonally ice-free Arctic Ocean across human and natural systems. Two, to assess how Arctic sea ice changes interact with mid-latitude weather and climate. Three, to improve Arctic observing strategies to support actionable knowledge. And four, to communicate the impacts of Arctic sea ice loss and its consequences to diverse audiences to support improved understanding and informed action. So the first activity that I'll, I'll highlight is building from the historic low sea ice conditions from this past winter in the Bering Sea that, that was mentioned just a few moments ago. So we saw the winter of 2017 and 18 having throughout the months of January through March, essentially the lowest ice on record going back to as early as the 1850s, if we use the historical sea ice atlas at, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And this combination of low pack ice, little or, or absent shore fest ice, and winter storm activity caused substantial damage in, in several Bering Sea communities. And so this, this plot here simply shows ice concentration around the communities of Gamble and Shishmaref and you can see the, the annual median as the thick gray line. Then 2017, 18 is, is the red line. So if you look at Gamble, for example, you can see that over the course of the year, they had huge fluctuations in, in, in the ice around the village, similarly in Shishmaref. Because these conditions are unusual and are likely to become more typical, we see this season, this past season as an opportunity to kind of systematically reflect to inform regional observing in the Bering Sea region. So in general, we want to ask the question is, what is needed for local communities to successfully respond to or be prepared for a potentially new environmental baseline for winter conditions in the coastal Bering Sea region? So more specifically, we're asking, how can observing assets, collaborative environmental monitoring programs like SIWO, for example, and other value-added products inform strategic management planning in Bering Sea communities. So while this is intended to be a, a regional observing assessment, we are looking to work closely with local communities to answer these questions. And so we're, we're working on an assessment framework, which is informed to some extent from the 2016 International Arctic Observing Assessment Framework and different approaches for, for engaging with the communities. Uh, one of those approaches is that we're holding a session in a side meeting this November at the Alaska Tribal Conference on Environmental Management, where the vast majority of participants come from communities. So we're gonna be focused on discussing how communities made decisions and responded to the conditions that they encountered last winter um, in regards to uh, storms, uh, uh, winter rainfall events, unusual wildlife um, sightings, and reduced access to hunting. Th those are some of the activities that will, will likely 
be discussed. The, the results of this, of, of this assessment will be a, a paper, a peer reviewed journal article, and also a report to communities. The second project that I'll highlight is a stakeholder analysis for Arctic sea ice loss that we're conducting. And so this is intended in a very general way to give some clarity to how we define stakeholders in the Arctic and how we think about stakeholder en engagement in general. So we're defining stakeholder engagement as a deliberate process of identifying and characterizing stakeholders, for example, by their interests, their influence and their size, to better understand their relationship to an issue and to each other for the purpose of identifying opportunities for engagement and for applying and sharing relevant and usable science. So the method that we're using is a comprehensive literature review using three prominent sources. Uh, we're designing a survey to share with the research community and some stakeholder communities that we have yet to completely define. And we're developing this, this analysis around three case studies. One focused on coastal erosion and village relocation, the second on Arctic shipping, and a third on Arctic and mid-latitude weather connections. So I, I won't go into more detail now, but, but I'll, I will offer, if there's interest in this in the future, to you know, perhaps give a future presentation on, on the results of this stakeholder analysis and for feedback from, from this community. The third activity that I'll highlight is, is just that the Search CIS Action Team is very engaged in and searches broader effort to prepare for Arctic Futures 2050, which is going to be a, a large uh, science and policy conference held uh, one year from now, September 4 to 6, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the National Academies of Science. And so there's several things that we're doing in lead up to this. One, we're developing Arctic Answers, which is a collection online of policy briefs uh, written by scientific experts to address a question that a policy expert might ask. But several of these questions are, are those that the media or even the general public may ask. And so for example, the CIS team is, is finalizing edits to a brief that's focused on what are the limits of, of Arctic sea ice predictability. Uh, secondly, we held this past April a scenarios workshop in Seattle focused on developing scenarios looking through 2050. And ever since this workshop, we've been engaged to kind of refine these scenarios very systematically as, as a community within search. And these scenarios will be a tool for designing this, this Arctic Futures Conference uh, next November, or sorry, next September in Washington, DC. And so I have the, the website at the bottom of this for Arctic 2050, which again is a, a search-wide effort. So I encourage you if, if you're interested in learning more about either of these three activities to visit that site. And this was meant to be a quick update, so I'm going to end it there. I will type my email address in the chat box, so if anyone's interested in learning more about any of these, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, I think all, all three of these presentations have been really helpful for me to hear. I feel like I am making some connections between the three and maybe there are some connections between the three of you that you've been able to make by communicating with each other. So thank you to everybody who presented.